aspect of this forum after having had such a fascinating conversation this morning uh, here at the table. Now, there was only one thing. There was no voice from Africa at the table, and we're going to compensate for that um, in the hour ahead. I am very honored and very pleased to be joined by one of the most experienced politicians in Africa. He was prime minister. He was president of his country's National Assembly. He led his Social Democratic Party from its foundation in 1990 to the year he became president in 2011, and he was a presidential candidate uh, in every election since 1993. I'm Stefan Grober. I'm with you News in Brussels. And uh, again, I'm very pleased to be joined by the President of the Republic of Niger, Mr. Mohamedou Isoufi. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Alors, Monsieur le Président. So, Mr. President, welcome once again. If I may say, you are an old fox of the Nigerian politics and you have given so many interviews throughout your uh, political career so it was really hard for me to find um, an original question so please let me start by asking how are you well I think I'm quite well and I would like to start by thanking of course the Institute for the dialogue of, of um, civilizations for having me here in order to to um, address this uh, wonderful audience. And uh, so, yes, once again, I'm fine. Great, so there have, a few weeks ago, you came back from New York where you participated at, this was, at the 74th uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. It was a rather somber uh, and dark uh, um, uh, as General Assembly because there were m many expressions of populism and uh, right wing, um, starting with uh, President Trump. But you are really a staunch supporter of multilateralism. So how did you, how was it this year? Well, as usual, it is actually, um, it gives us a chance to talk to each other. And uh, this is um, why we're here as well. Uh, this is the goal of the DOC. So at the General Assembly, we talk to each other and we try to see where the world stands and we try to look at uh, the... Um, we took stock of what goes on, we um, uh, took stock of what takes place uh, in uh, the countries where populism is on a rise, we are worried by the increase of inequality with in the world. Unfortunately, uh, the richest countries and richest people have doubled and their wealth uh, against the 50% who are 40% uh, who are uh, who became uh, even poorer. So this is a great challenge for uh, peace as well as global stability. And of course, we also voted and expressed uh, uh, our concerns when it comes to uh, this return to uh, the uh, issues pertaining to the climate change and uh, uh, finally uh, what divides people and the spectacular uh, issue of migration that might uh, rise to an international crisis. So all that makes us think on the necessary reforms for um, politic, uh, political and economical governance. Uh, so you think that there should be a new economical and political governance. What would be, what would be the tools and what would you like to change? What I would like to change is, first of all, the institutions. The institutions who are responsible for this governance for um, 
political uh, stability and security, it's uh, the UN and in that we have the Security Council and it has to be, uh, there have to be reforms and Africa must um, really uh, increase its uh, presence and we have uh, uh, been uh, we have two permanent representatives in the um, Security Council and five non-permanent uh, councillors. But it's not only about reforming the Security Council, but also reforming the General Assembly of the United Nations and uh, the Economical and Social uh, Committee as well. So this is a reform of the uh, institutions who are in charge of political and economical, uh, of political, excuse me, governance, because I think that the representation there is not really democratical. And uh, for example, Africa is underrepresented. I can also give some examples of decisions that were taken regarding uh, us, for example, the intervention in Libya. The intervention in Libya, I am the head of a country who is a neighboring country to Libya and uh, I learned that from the radio. So today Niger as well as all the other countries uh, in the region uh, are paying a hefty price because of all this intervention. And when it comes to um, economical and financial um, global governance, so uh, we know also that the institutions there have to change the way they operate. If we want a more human and more just world, well, we have to root for these um, changes. Uh, well, we had this morning someone say that we have to get rid of G7, and you said at New York the world must uh, enter into a win-win cooperation uh, so within the actual international context, do you feel that you are a minority and uh, oh, who are your partners? Well, indeed, the world must uh, go into a win-win cooperation and relations of that type uh, instead of uh, uh, nil-sum, so um, of, z of uh, relations of zero-sum. So. We have to really face this. It's not a dilemma. We have to keep cooperating. So the countries and the people have to uh, cooperate and collaborate within a win-win pers perspective. Unfortunately, this is not the case today. If we take, for example, uh, the global trade example, Unfortunately, this is not based on fair trade and uh, this is building inequalities in other countries, especially between the uh, northern countries and the countries of the, of the south. So there have to be new rules in order to uh, make uh, trade uh, fairer. So um, you have been recently elected as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. So what do you intend to do within the Security Council? What is a project that you'd like to push forward? It is true that um, the Niger has been uh, elected uh, since this uh, January 2020, will be a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And what we want to do with this uh, mandate, uh, uh, well, we will strive to push forward the reforms and uh, uh, within the Security Council as well as the political governance and reform um, global economical governance. And also, I will express um, the concerns of my country and of my region, of the continent and the region Sahel regarding security. Because in the region of Sahel, we are facing threats, terrorist threats, uh, threats from uh, criminal organizations, and these are strategic threats, and these could really destabilize the area. And we feel that the international community is not actually looking towards Sahel, they're looking elsewhere, and they don't 
uh, we hope that uh, they will never turn to solutions such as the ones they imposed on Syria or other countries or Afghanistan um, and what they did in order to try and get rid of the uh, ISIL. So we will be expressing these concerns uh, as part of the Security Council and we're also worried about climate change because obviously we are a country, uh, we are a region that will suffer a lot. Uh, the great increase of uh, temperature, um, because uh, if it uh, climbs to two or, or five degrees, uh, for us it will be huge. Two degrees for the whole world is two, three or even five um, Celsius degrees uh, for certain parts of Africa, especially Sahel, so it's a big issue. Uh, another important element, uh, and I will come back, to, that's another important element, I'll come back to that, but there's another uh, issue, $200 billion, uh, uh, Mr. President, is the uh, black market of um, drugs, pharmaceutical uh, drugs. It, it, it's something that represents a huge danger for uh, African governments. So, uh, Mr. President, you are um, engaged uh, along with other uh, African heads of state against this uh, fake drug uh, uh, market. So, well, these um, traffic uh, trafficking of false drugs is very important and I work with the Basile Foundation in order to bring together several heads of state in order to think about the response we have to have against this uh, issue. It's true that 10% of uh, drugs uh, or even more um, uh, are, or in the case of Niger, it's 25%, are false. So these is, are fake drugs, and this is a huge issue of security and public health. And unfortunately, until now, we don't have the necessary legislation in order to uh, make this um, our law. And we have to criminalize the traffic of uh, fake drugs and find solutions in order to end that. Another very important issue, uh, in West Africa, we see that uh, the terrorist threat has increased in Sahel and uh, it goes also a little bit uh, to the south. So you uh, wanted to... Um, uh, to plead in favour of uh, the countries of the region of Sahel. So are you satisfied by the response of the international community? Oh, no, unfortunately I am not. Uh, we didn't have the support we expected and the international uh, community is looking elsewhere. They're not looking into what takes place in the uh, region of Sahel, but this is unfortunately uh, an, an area where we have or criminal organizations, terrorist organizations that are posing a threat to the region and the continent and the world and this could escalate to a conflict and um, this could indeed uh, cause issues to the whole region so we would like to see a show of solidarity and support uh, on behalf of the international community uh, uh, and uh, uh, con and con to condemn this, uh, like they did with Daesh, with uh, uh, the Islamic State uh, in Syria. And uh, I would like to remind you that uh, they uh, did that. Uh, they started uh, the, the support uh, against Daesh uh, and IC the Islamic State back in 2014, and uh, they're not done yet. And we are fighting against Boko Haram uh, in the, and we are alone in doing that. We have our own means, our own resources only. And we have uh, 
uh, actually uh, put in place uh, um, a collaboration between Chad, Mauritania, Niger, and Nigeria uh, to fight against Boko Haram. And we are also bringing together Cameroon, Chad, uh, uh, and the military forces to uh, fight against Boko Haram and the terrorist threat. Unfortunately, we do not have special forces, uh, military. Uh, if we had, we could be in a better position to face all that. So the um, economic community of uh, the states uh, of uh, West Africa has uh, taken that into consideration. And we're trying to v um, avoid the metastasis of this uh, cancer of terrorism uh, elsewhere. and. Uh, they decided to contribute uh, to the resources against this threat. But what we want is that the solidarity is uh, at an international scale. For example, we want that, uh, that the uh, uh, G5 um, and Sahel uh, cooperation uh, becomes even stronger. We wish that the United Nations uh, uh, committee uh, working for the stabilization of Mali uh, is actually um, working also towards that and becomes more uh, aggressive in order to allow us to fight against terrorists because for the moment um, MISMA is only doing a counting job and uh, uh, they are not really um, keeping uh, peace. So what takes place in the whole region is making us say that we have to think hard on the nature of the mission of the United Nations because uh, this was an institution born after the Second World War but now the conditions are different, we have different threats, so we have to think long and hard on the nature of the peacemaking um, mission of the United Nations. But there are uh, some activities, despite the military support of uh, the United Nations and France. And however, jihadism is an, a concern. Well, yes, you, it's right to, remem to remind us that we have the support of France uh, through Bakam, and I would like to seize this opportunity to thank France for the support they lend us. But uh, France is, uh, is the only one. There should be other countries as well that, that come and intervene, and the international community in its whole uh, expresses its will to assist us against this uh, threat, because these are really um, grave threats. We can't underestimate them. These threats must not metastasize, as I said before. It's like a cancer where at the moment it becomes inoperable if you leave it. At, the, at this moment we can operate, but uh, after a while we'll lose the patient. You have talked about uh, Libya, where things are still quite uh, fragile. The, um, the war caused more than 10,000 uh, deaths and 120 people have uh, been uh, driven away in six months of conflict um, and uh, we are right back at the start. It's like playing shoots and ladders. So uh, what has to be done in order to manage uh, the, the, Lib the case of Libya. I said before that the intervention in Libya is an example that proves that uh, global uh, uh, political governance is not democratic. We have not been consulted and we had um, informed the international community against this um, intervention and because we knew that this would actually cause chaos in Libya. Uh, we, we actually said that this would lead to Somalization. It's the term, the actual term we, we used, because the terrorists cut the power in, in uh, Libya, and this is in something we cannot abide uh, by. We cannot have uh, 
a neighboring country uh, with that uh, situation. Unfortunately, nobody listened to us. And in Libya now is a total chaos. There's a total absence of uh, control over the territory of Libya. And of course, the threats against the Sahel uh, have been amplified by the uh, Libyan crisis. So the international community has not been able to find a solution because they do not fully understand that the goal in Libya is not to go to elections right now. The um, restoration, uh, bringing back the state is necessary. And after you do that, we can do whatever we want and even think about uh, uh, free democratic elections. But Africa has a very clear position. And Africa and the African states must be involved in decisions such as this one. And of course, we must have a say in what takes place in Libya. And I said that at the um, General Assembly, and we must work together uh, with the UN because we have experts of what takes place in uh, conflicts in the African uh, uh, continent. And what uh, actually, uh, Africa found the solution to the Sudanese crisis, and we managed to uh, really implement this. Are the important issues. The fight against climate change, you also talked about that. So we saw these last months a strong global mobilization um, for a change in the policies regarding climate change. But talk to us a little bit about the uh, nefarious uh, impact of climate change in your country and in your continent. Well, this is a great reality in our country. We see that every day we are living um, uh, uh, under conditions that prove that climate change um, is um, in fact here and poverty is linked to the impact of climate change. Um, the um, uh, Lake of Chad uh, has been reduced to uh, uh, 2,500 uh, uh, square kilometers and we have less resources uh, for our animals and for uh, agriculture and people uh, have less to feed and uh, you see how uh, of course climate change has a great impact and brings about poverty and obviously there is also a link between climate change and the um, uh, public health uh, issues. Uh, for example, malaria. Malaria is uh, um, increasing with this increase over temperature. We see that as well in Sahel. And yesterday I was in Lyon. I participated at, the, at a meeting on the sixth conference uh, for uh, of the uh, World Fund uh, for the uh, fight against um, uh, tuberculosis, AIDS and uh, malaria. And we talked about the impact in, of uh, climate change on the public health and the health of all citizens. So there is an undeniable link between um, climate change and terrorism as well. Because Poverty, poor health, and of course, uh, financial economical problems push people to um, integrate in such groups. So, this might be an indirect link to terrorism, but it is a fact. And of course, we are all saying there's no planet Earth 2.0. This is the one planet we have, and we have to. Be very careful. Now let's talk a little bit about the mobilization uh, that you talked about last February. The Sahel countries um, put in place an investment plan for uh, climate change at 400 million euros. It's uh, uh, billion euros. Uh, but do you think that will be enough? 
Yes, it seems very, very, a very, very large sum, but it is in scale of the uh, issues of infrastructure and development that Sahel region is facing vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the uh, climate change. And very often, as we say, the fight against terrorism has two facets. There's the military facet, which is a short term, and there's also the uh, development aspect. Uh, and this is a long term uh, if we, aspect that we have to follow through until the solution. Because this will bring about social and economical growth and development, and that will allow us to get rid of the terrorist threat. And we must aim for the uh, economic and political and social uh, growth and development of uh, border, bordering uh, regions in order to uh, improve uh, the quality of life of uh, the people. And we have a plan of about four billion uh, dollars and uh, we have been assured that these uh, funds will be uh, given for that. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I would like to ask uh, my two colleagues, Gabriele Ramos, that you've also seen this morning, uh, the Sherpa to the G20, and uh, Sundaram, to join us. And during this second round, we will be talking about economy. So the two colleagues uh, know more about that than me. So uh, they're well, better versed in uh, economic issues. So, well, no, Stefan, I think you did that great. And uh, Mr. President, it's a great honor to share this uh, discussion with you as well as with my friend Gemma. We are very proud because we know how the Niger has grew and has pushed forward uh, economic growth and it's back in 2011 when you had uh, a 5% uh, growth and this is proving that when political decisions are well thought and well implemented, they give up results. So we were asked to make a um, comparison between the economic uh, growth of Asia, Korea, China and Africa. And in Africa, we have a community of countries which have very different characteristics and Niger is now giving uh, hope that things can uh, improve very much. So we work at the OECD with you. So if we think about Asia, we think about infrastructure, uh, investment and education, improvement of education, we think about uh, the its connection to international market. And I think that the um, experience of Korea or China um, show that uh, they can be uh, a great with great quality there is also um, uh, exports to the whole world the asian countries have instituted uh, quality controls in what they did and it was important but there's also another issue that um, people know much less when we talk about uh, growth in asia and this is that these were countries that had controllable uh, inequality levels. Uh, Korea started experiencing this uh, great growth when they launched the uh, territory reform. Uh, in fact, they managed to reach a level of quality, equality, excuse me, that is higher. So my question, since you are a social democrat, can we really uh, talk about uh, uh, decreasing inequalities for the benefit of growth and not only for social issues? Well, 
Um, thank you very much for the question. You, thank you for noting the growth and the um, development of Niger in the last 10 years. We have a very dynamic economy. The uh, development, uh, the growth uh, is now, uh, the growth rate is now at uh, f reaching 7% and this is very important and it is um, inherent in infrastructure, in development, uh, in rural development um, and uranium and petrol obviously and oil are very important uh, elements. We are also striving to create a, a good business environment and put in place uh, good macroeconomic uh, management and I think that all that um, is uh, uh, what brings about this good growth rate. And I think actually that the whole of Africa is growing and, and the African leaders have specific uh, agendas. We have the uh, uh, Agenda 2063 uh, uh, that is development specific um, areas for growth for Africa with very specific and detailed plans uh, on infrastructure uh, and development of infrastructure in Africa or the um, industrial development uh, in Africa or um, uh, the development and growth of mines in Africa. So. Africa is currently, uh, I think, the um, continent of the 21st century. However, we have to ask whether the Asian model can be applied, can be implemented in Africa, because we might be inspired by this model. I think that all the um, uh, experiments and best practices can be useful, not only of uh, East Asian, but also experiences, but also the England uh, experience because it was the first nation to be industrialized and we can also be inspired by the example of France because France and England uh, were the first ones who experienced this um, wave of industrialism and then the Germans joined the game and then the Americans and besides the East Asian countries and especially Japan Japan has been uh, inspired by the German um, example and they say it very often this is what inspired them to reach these extraordinary levels of growth so very often when we are talking about uh, the Asian model we tend to forget the uh, role of state the great and very important role that state played in the industrialism because the state was what made the strategic choices and the other players became uh, those who relayed the strategic choices. Uh, you know that in economic uh, philosophy there are some who want more state, less state, liberalism, etc. But uh, in the case of um, East Asian countries, be it... Uh, Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or Hong Kong, Singapore or recently China that developed this uh, um, new model uh, in large scale, we have to underline the very important role played by state. And I think the same, the same happened in Germany the state was the one who propulsed uh, the industrialism by setting the goals in uh, pre-war Germany and it was railway. Railway was what required infra mechanical infrastructure and then uh, they developed metallurgy and this required also uh, the uh, development of uh, mining and the same went for uh, Japan because it copied the Germany example and the other industrialized Asian countries followed this example and now China 
itself is copying the same model. So Africa, well, uh, is also inspired by that. We, we can't be uh, excluded from that. We are looking towards uh, the Europeans and the Americans and we're looking to the um, experience of the Asian model and we want to use all that in order to uh, grow uh, uh, Africa. Uh, I, I hope you don't mind. Um, uh, let me... Uh, I very much appreciate many of the things uh, you have been trying to do uh, particularly in terms of trying to make the break with the colonial past. Uh, this break with the colonial past is uh, extremely important. And this is where I think um, the attempt particularly to have a, uh, uh, numero... Yeah. Yes, I, I was expressing, expressing my appreciation for you for your efforts to break with the colonial past and particularly to, to, to uh, open, uh, to consider various uh, other experiences, including the experiences in East, Af in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, I think uh, your, your approach is very pragmatic and this is, I think, extremely important. Not to try to copy any particular East Asian experience, whether Japanese or Chinese or Vietnamese or any other experience, but rather to consider the lessons which can be drawn from East Asia for your own experience, for your own situation. And in this regard, what you have been trying to do uh, with trying to break out of the currency situation, the monetary situation which, you have, uh, which has continued for, for many, many decades uh, since independence is especially important and the West African initiative in this regard is especially important. But uh, let me suggest that there are two or three other, other uh, matters uh, perhaps which might be worthwhile considering. Uh, during the first uh, couple of decades after independence in many parts of Africa, including uh, 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 Francophone West Africa, there was an attempt to try to uh, develop uh, on the basis of agriculture, and in some cases where it was possible, uh, some, uh, some industries, uh, industries suitable for those conditions. And that resulted in a relatively re high rate of growth during the 1960s and 1970s. However, all this came to an end uh, from the end of the 1970s, and then uh, much of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa experienced a, a quarter century of, uh, of, of very slow growth, of economic stagnation, uh, um, partly due to the indebtedness, but due to a range of other problems. Let me, um, there are, in, in my view, uh, some problems with the, with the solutions uh, which have been offered uh, to Africa, particularly the, uh, the, solution, the, the suggestion that Africa uh, has to be externally oriented in order to develop. Uh, in, the, in the past, the period of highest growth uh, before the 1980s was achieved precisely without this big external orientation. Of course, there was an external orientation to learn in terms of technology, uh, to learn uh, new agricultural <coughs> techniques, and so on and so forth. Um, so th this whole question of trade being essential and the imposition of, of so-called free trade ar arrangements which are actually uh, do not serve developing country interests. For example, as you, as you know very well, uh, commodity prices have declined uh, since uh, 2014. And this, of course, has affected those of us who are all involved in producing uh, primary commodities uh, to, a, to a great extent. Um, and another major issue, of course, is finance. We were all encouraged to open up our economies to welcome uh, international finance. Uh, but, you know, there was a Malaysian economist who, was, uh, who wrote uh, from jail in 1960. He said, this is like opening up a birdcage and expecting more birds to fly in than to fly out. And, of course, this is unlikely to, to happen. That was written 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago. And we have seen that what has happened is that private capital, which has accumulated in Africa, has actually flown out and Africa has become increasingly dependent on remittances, on, uh, on uh, ODA, where, where, where uh, some countries are receiving ODA, uh, as well as uh, other sources of external finance. Um, the reliance on foreign direct investment 
has not been self-interested. It is obviously uh, interested in, in, in investments to make money. Uh, that is perfectly understandable from the point of view of the investor. Uh, but it, it that doesn't necessarily benefit uh, many, many people uh, in Africa. And what we have seen is that, for example, the, the uh, transparency in initiative for extractive industries have been written in such a way to eliminate corruption, but actually to lower the cost for the investor. So we find a very uh, peculiar situation in, in, in Tanzania, for example, uh, where um, it is the third largest gold producer after South Africa and Ghana yeah, in, in Africa. But the consequence of this uh, investment in gold is that the, the Tanzanian people are actually subsidizing uh, uh, the, 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 the gold mines uh, by providing the infrastructure for, for the gold mines to be, to be successful. And uh, the Tanzanian be people get very little benefit because there's hardly any taxes imposed on the, on, the gold in, on the gold mining industry in Tanzania. So we have many situations like this where laws have been rewritten uh, in ways which have been benefiting foreign capital, international finance, and so on and so forth with relatively little influence. So many of the initiatives, some of the initiatives we have seen in ECOWAS, in NEPAD, and so on, are extremely important. But unfortunately, there is not enough strong international support for this. One of the huge op big opportunities, because of, if I may just conclude on this issue, because, uh, <laughs> because of the problem of desertification, which the countries in the Sahel are all facing, is the opportunity of green finance associated with fighting climate change and the opportunities which are uh, uh, in relation to that. And this, it seems to me, is one, op one opportunity which might be useful for countries like Niger to try to, to, to move forward. Je pense que vous choisissez en fait, les points euh, à en fait, répondre. Il y a plusieurs voilà. dans votre intervention. <rire> avez... I think there were way too many questions. I'll, I'll try and answer, but I would like to come back to the question of um, Madame regarding the Asian uh, models. I insisted uh, on the role of the state, but I omitted um, the um, role of the um, organizations of delocalization, sorry, um, they benefited from delocalization. And if we think about China, uh, the 60% uh, of uh, China exports to USA is due to the fact that there are American companies um, which are uh, operating in China. So uh, the direct um, foreign investments played a very important role uh, in uh, the transfers. Now, to come back to Africa, first of all, we must say that we are uh, fully um, conscious of the fact that we have very important resources, um, be it uh, uh, natural resources or human resources, uh, our population is young, which is very, very important. Today, Africa uh, has uh, two uh, billion of uh, uh, two uh, billions uh, in uh, 2050. We think that we'll have about five billion. So uh, I think that um, this is goes to show that by 2040 will be the most important uh, labor force in the world with about 30 million young people which will um, go in the um, in the labor market so we have so many um, uh, uh, things going great for us and we have to uh, put them into good use and yes you're right to reminded me to uh, of the experience of uh, the 60s and the 70s when Africa stayed within the colonial um, frame of mind. Um, uh, we were just producing raw material and it was others who got them and uh, actually um, benefited from them. So 
uh, Africa was uh, selling raw material at a very low prices, whereas uh, the North was uh, uh, selling the finished products. And of course, you know the differences between the two prices. And, and uh, this is the issue of uh, unfair trade, because uh, what we sell is losing value and what the, the others are selling is gaining value. And that was a vicious circle. And Africa wants to put an end to this. We are no longer under the uh, colonial, under this colonial um, pact and uh, deals. And uh, we are uh, currently creating uh, free exchange uh, zones. And since uh, July, last July, on the um, occasion of uh, the um, meeting of the African Union in Niamey, we decided that we have to put in place other plans as well. So we have the, the plan for the uh, development of infrastructure in, F in Africa, and uh, we are pu putting in place energy, telecommunications, railway, um, and uh, airport infrastructure. Uh, and create also this free trade uh, area. So these, I talked before about the case of Germany. Development and growth came to Germany through the railways. So this is why I say that we have to learn from the experience of others. Uh, infrastructure is very important and we are determined to see through the end uh, the implementation of uh, modern infrastructure in Africa. Even today, to go from Niamey to Pretoria, it's easier to go through Paris or London instead of flying directly from uh, Niamey to Pretoria. So we have to uh, stop relying on foreign um, infrastructure and we have to tear down the walls that actually um, close uh, the countries of Africa to each other. And Africa is rich. Africa is rich in uh, raw material, but will become really rich. And our people will become rich when we will use it in manufacture and sell finished products. One example, c c cocoa. Cocoa is used to make chocolate. The countries who are making uh, finest uh, cocoa like uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast realize that they are losing 30% of its value by exporting. So why wouldn't Ghana make chocolate? Because they will benefit, reap all the benefits of uh, added value. Uh, this is just one example. The same goes for uranium for ni uh, Niger. Uh, it's used to make electricity. Uh, why export uranium and not and not to uh, export uh, uh, electrical power. Why should we export raw material in all, instead of exporting finished products? Uh, so Africa has to do everything in its hand in order to control uh, value chains. And this is what we decided as well within the agenda of 2063 and the development of agriculture. Uh, you talked about uh, the situation in the 60s and the 70s. Why did things fail? Because in the beginning of the 80s, we were uh, put under um, the uh, under programs uh, that um, didn't allow us to grow on that uh, respect. For example, a country from Ghana was more developed than uh, South Korea at the beginning of the 60s, but what caused this divergence between the um, Asian development and growth and Africa? Unfortunately, in, starting in the 80s, we had uh, issues of uh, uh, structural adjustment and these um, create havoc. So we have to reform the international institutions, as I said before. 
And this is the consensus of African countries and uh, we know what Bretton Woods has said. We have to uh, really learn from the lessons in other continents in order to um, improve uh, the situation in our country. So, we are putting into place programs uh, on a regional scale. So, all the plans that I indicated will be put into implementation after the regional committee session. We have, for example, a common agricultural policy and we are also thinking of having uh, perhaps uh, one um, one currency. This is something that will be discussed uh, uh, at the next assembly, general assembly. Great conclusion, uh, Mr. President, Your Excellency. Well, time flies and we're at the end of this session. One last tiny question. So, in uh, April 2021, you will be stepping out of office and you will go into retirement. So, what are your personal plans? Well, in fact, in um, April uh, 2nd, 2021, I will be retiring, I will be stepping down because this is what the Constitution of Niger um, is uh, dictating and I will not change the constitution, uh, we have to promote um, the alternating, uh, the alternation in power in order to allow the country and the people to express themselves and to um, aspire to uh, elect the best uh, every time. So this is the first time that will uh, actually happen since our independence. Since our independence, there were always uh, uh, changes uh, where uh, the uh, president didn't step down and they had to be um, enforced. So this is my grandest um, dream to give the relay in 2021 in a democratic way. So what will I do after April 2nd? Well, I will tell you in confidence and in private. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for having following us. And I think that the press conference will take place now. Once again, thank you and have a great day here. Thank you.